without ever crossing middle grade lines. Was that ever a hindrance to you not being able to, to say uh, more interesting and colorful language that would presumably be used by members of this age group um, or to be able to you know, further go into details on, on some of the darker aspects of the system? You know, I really didn't feel like it was. I mean, it's funny, you know, and you're right. Like, I think, you know, one of the problems with social issues books, I mean, I've got two kids who are, you know, 13 and 14 right now, and getting them to read a social issues book can be really challenging sometimes, because I think there's a misperception that they're like work, you know, that they're not fun. And so, you know, like you said, like, even though what we're talking about right now is very serious about sort of the larger issue, I didn't really, you know, I put that mostly in my afterword and it's in the book, but I thought it was important for the book to be funny, you know, and I think the characters are very funny, especially Vic, he like, and Quentin cracks me up constantly. Um, and I think it was also really important to me with both of these books, because they do deal with serious subject matter, that they would have a hopeful ending, you know, not an unrealistic ending and not an unearned ending, but a hopeful one, because you know, like I said, with my kids, I know that if the ending isn't at least a little bit happy, they are done. Like they are not. <laughs> they hate that. I mean, really, like they absolutely cannot stand it when that happens. Um, and even in the example that you gave, you know, with the ASS, I mean, it's the funny thing about that is it's not even like being used as a swear word. It's a misunderstanding of Asperger's mm -hmm. and what and you know, and like a kid mishearing it. And that's something that I was always doing as a kid. So I always think it's really funny when kids do that. I didn't, it didn't really restrict me. I mean, I think a lot of it is that for all that they've gone through um, at their heart, these kids, you know, particularly Vic and Mar and Quentin are very innocent, even for their age. You know, they've got this strange sort of dichotomy where, um, you know, there, there's part of them that has seen more than most kids their age, but they also kind of cling to this childhood, you know, and Vic's whole fantasy life about being a super spy and, you know, doing missions and all of that. Like, I feel like that's kind of like a, a shell for him. You know, it's a safe space that enables him to actually be more childlike than maybe other kids in his grade and situation would be. That was a fantasy. I I, I was expecting the uh, <laughs> super uh, secret. I wanted you to. Oh, I wanted people to kind of question it. Yeah, for that for the first chapter, right? For his first chapter, I I wanted people to sort of be like, wait a minute, what's happening here? And I initially started the book on that, and my editor wasn't having it. She thought it was too confusing. Um, I don't know. I mean, I always feel like we don't give kids enough credit. I think that they're much more sophisticated readers than they're sometimes, you know, thought of as being. Um, I mean, my kids read it, it, it read, like read that version of it and had no problem with it right from the start. And I think it's, um, you know, spoilers aside, I think, it, I think it's pretty obvious early on um, that as much fun as Vic is having and as much as we want it to be true, uh, that, it, that it's probably, you know, we'll read the book, yeah. find out, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's maybe not true. Uh, and oh heck, it's, it's very heartbreaking when, 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 when he comes to the realization that it's not true. So it's, it's stay tuned, you're gonna laugh, but you're, you're <laughs> also gonna cry a little bit before the end is so you're gonna feel good, it's very sweet and, and the ending is uplifting, so you're, you're, you're gonna have a good time. Um, let me ask you about uh, writing from three perspectives, because uh, you're writing from Nevaeh's perspective, you're writing from Vic's perspective, which is lots of fun, and then Quentin's perspective, uh, yeah. which is extra fun, because Quentin just sees the world in a, in a way that uh, very few uh, do. Uh, so what was the advantage of writing from those three perspectives rather than a single perspective narrative? Um, I really wanted to get as close to the points of view of each of these characters as possible. You know, it's a third person book, but it kind of feels like a first person when you're in each character's perspective. Um, and I think it just gives you a larger pitch picture of the story. And I think it also, you know, I like, I mean, the other boy is actually entirely first person. And I think that really worked for that book. Um, for this book, I wanted to show like, since it is sort of an ensemble piece, I wanted to show how some of the perceptions that they had of each other were the result of misunderstandings or miscommunication. 
how, you know, one of the reasons that they were all living these kind of separate existences um, were because they had put up these walls themselves. And so having the chapter shift from one to the other is sort of emblematic of those walls. Um, and I've got some questions about why the youngest character in the book, Mara, doesn't have her own point of view sections, um, how she's more of, you know, just a participant in the other people's stories. And uh, I got a couple of comments from people who weren't crazy about that. They wanted to see her perspective. Um, I don't know. I mean, I felt like the thing about Mara is she is in a way like the conscience of the book, you know, like she sort of embodies like all of this, the best of all of them, you know, and she's also largely the engine that propels a lot of the plot along when you go back and look at the story, even though that's not necessarily apparent while you're reading it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I always, I like challenging myself with writing too. I feel like it's good to kind of, you know, undertake different techniques as you progress as a writer. And so this was one that I really wanted to try. Yeah, there are some books, I, I never book shame, so I won't name them, uh, but where you're reading multiple perspectives, like this is just the author, come on. <laughs> I, I know <laughs> this voice, we've been doing it for two other chapters as, as other characters, but it's all the same. And these are uh, three very, very distinct uh, voices. Did you write them uh, simultaneously or did you uh, write uh, one character story and then another character story to keep them them separate in your, your mind? How, how, how did you write it? No, I, you know, honestly, I just wrote it the way that it happened. I mean, it was a linear book for me. So, you know, I literally just like originally, you know, I think it starts now with Quentin, but originally it started with Vic and I literally just cycled like one, two, three, one, two, three, like scene by scene from one character to the next and kind of what each of them was going through at that point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, and I'm also not one of those people who plots, like I really, didn't know what this story was going to be. I had like a very like overarching idea, you know, that it was going to be sort of like my homage to Stand By Me, which is one of my all time favorite movies. And I wanted that kind of feeling, you know, that sort of like childhood innocence and, you know, kid, like a book basically that's largely without adults, right? You know, when the adults are present, they're generally sort of interfering with what the kids are trying to do. Um, so I wanted to have that sense as you go through, you know, as you go with them from uh, Echo Park to Torrance, California, which, you know, anyone who lives out here can tell you is not an easy thing to do without a car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 